My name is uh, Martin van der Gelder, and as you might have guessed, I will be your chair this late afternoon and early evening. And as such, of course, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you all here at the Alexander von Humboldt lecture, which will be given by <coughs> Professor Annemarie Moll. So for those of you who attend a von Humboldt for the first time, the lectures were already initiated in 1999, so we are actually celebrating our 10th anniversary already, uh, by the Human Geography Group of this university, and we have been able to get already quite a long list of renowned scholars for many, for many disciplines <coughs> and many countries uh, to get them here and invite them to give a lecture. The current program is uh, organized jointly with the um, research group Governance and Places and uh, evolves around the theme, oh, it's not on this uh, slide, uh, around the theme of reflexive methodology and as the organizers have put it on the website in the general uh, description, it is about doing post-positivist research and post-positive research then seen as an approach which recognizes that research findings uh, are the results of the interaction between the researcher, the research process, <coughs> and one's empirical material. And as they say also, the term reflexive is readily used, but it's still a question how we can carry out our research reflexively, and this is exactly what is the uh, central point, what we are addressing in this series. In the series, we have already discussed the critical a realist approach with Andrew Sayer and the more ethnographic approaches and analyses with Michael Crank. And in the next few months, we also have still some lectures on critical discourse analysis with John Forrester and Jakob Torving, lectures for which you are, of course, also cordially invited. So today's topic, which will be discussed by <coughs> Professor Annemarie Moll, is closely related to the Actor Network Theory, or maybe we should say post or after Actor Network Theory, and whether or not you would like your, to call yourself an Actor Network Theorist, of course is something for you to confirm or not, and maybe you <laughs> can address it in your lecture as well. The research of Professor Moll focuses on the foundations of the social sciences with a special interest in the materiality of our existence and human corporality. And in her book, well-known book, The Body Multiple, she's exploring new ways and methods to include these aspects in social theory. So very fitting in the current theme of the series. She problematizes the transferability of objects and practices using metaphors like networks, fluids, semi-permeable boundaries, and from a geographical point of view, after all, I am a geographer, I'm especially intrigued by her discussion on the transferring the global north to the south and vice versa. In her last book, most recent book, The Logic of Care, which was published in English last year, I think, for 2006, the Dutch version, she addresses the issue of the knowing of and intervening, of, uh, intervening in bodies. Amory Moore was recently appointed as Professor of Social Theory, Humanism and Materiality, although not appointed, he asked, you told us, if it was possible to go to Amsterdam, at the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Science of the University of Amsterdam, a chair established by the Socrates Foundation, and before that she was the Socrates Professor in Political Philosophy at the University of Trento. So, without further ado, I would like to give a call now to Professor Moll for a lecture with the title What Methods Do. This is not me, this is uh, this. Yeah. What Methods Do, Evocative Questions and Difficult Audiences, and then talking about transferability. Um, also, in this lecture, it remains to be seen, obviously, who is going to raise the evocative questions and who, in the end, is the difficult audience. You Before. are the difficult audience, of course. Well. <laughs> no, maybe not. Good. Uh, good, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I have changed my title, as these things always go. And... Um, 
I make the... This is uh, going to put a boundary between uh, me and you. We have so many already. And I have slightly shifted my title to say, and I thought I should stick to the question what methods do, because that's why you're here. But I've shifted to the question why this is a geographical method. method. And in a way, I'm going to do a classical trick that lots of French philosophers did in the 1970s, which is to shift from what you might be interested in, which is the method of geography, to the geography of method, and to turn things around. And this is actually part of my method, or my way of researching, to shift things around, to transport them, and play with them in ways that uh, may help one to see new things and see things in new ways. Let me make a first confession. I am not a geographer, as identities go. I am an amateur of geography. I do not have a formal training. And this may allow you to say, uh, in the time we have for questions, that I haven't understood the least bit about your discipline. <coughs> and maybe I haven't. I mean, fine. I mean, I, I would be curious to learn where I haven't. But the good side of being an amateur is that one can take from a discipline not the heavy, burdening things that everybody should learn in their first three years, but just the nice, fancy books that are such fun to read and to work with. So the amateur can do the fun bits, and this is what, um, uh, what I like about the position of the amateur. So, but to keep things a bit tamed, I'll do the dutiful th thing of giving you the overview first. So what, is, what are the steps of today's talk? First, I'll talk, I'll talk to you about the first way in which method became a ge geographical, geographical, what a stupid word, difficult word, with a geographical issue, which is b how, by the way in which in the social studies of science, as uh, I call it in a, an article with John Lowe, with whom I did a lot of the work that I'm presenting today, uh, social studies of science have brought the sciences down to earth, as we call it. That will be step one. I'll explain what that means. Next, uh, I think there has been a shift or an added something in the way we can understand differences inside the sciences. For a long time, this was studied only in a historical way. And then we started to add the topographical way to study differences. And topography is your field, of course, so that's uh, a second way in, of, in which geography became crucial to the understanding of science. The third one is that it uh, has to do with situatedness. As soon as, you, as your entrance into reality is an entrance through practices, rather than through bodies, chairs, or other objects, through practices in which objects are lived with, things are lived with, practices are always somewhere. They're situated. Now, what situatedness is, and methods for that matter, along with that, are situated. We come to talk about thought. I'll talk about motive influence, and there again, I'll go from a historical to a spatial way of understanding, and then I'll raise some further questions. Or rather, <coughs> I already put down the most difficult questions, because that will make my time in the discussion easier, because if I ask them, you have to answer them, and not the other way around. Bringing the sciences down to earth. In the late 70s, uh, there was a crucial shift in the study of the sciences, uh, a few people actually from slightly different theoretical backgrounds went to do <coughs> laboratory studies with ethnographic and or anthropological uh, techniques. And while so f up to that point, uh, especially in philosophy of science, science had been discussed as a set of theories that could and couldn't be falsified, and then in other disciplines they had to do their philosophy of science course and read Popper and Kuhn, and that was the way you did your reflexivity, you did your meta in all kinds of fields through that kind of philosophical <coughs> repertoire. Laboratory studies went uh, to study actually labs and how things are done there and what it is practiced. And I juxtaposed the lab with uh, the butcher because in a way, it is a bit gross, the butcher, but in a way you could say that uh, first, what the laboratory studies did was to show that a lab was much more like a kitchen than it was like a cloister. In a way, the sciences had continuously been understood as a kind of religious practice rather than as a kitchen. And what, uh, so th 
one could talk about a scientific belief, for instance, which is a very religious type of term that you could even criticize inside theology, but that's another matter. Okay, scientists were brought down to earth because they were studied in actually mundane settings and mundane practices. Now that brings along a very crucial shift in how you may start to think about the products of science. If you think, yes, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll help you go through the slide first maybe. The first, if you in, are in a context, in the traditional context, I make good dichotomies here for didactic reasons. Uh, if you're in a, a conventional context, the question, if you have a scientific finding, is whether it can be generalized. So if you find that in person one there are bowels here, might this be a general fact about the human body or not? So you open up five corpses instead of one, and you find the bowels in every corpse in that place, and you start to think, hey, this may well be a generalizable fact. And then you can discuss, is five corpses enough, or should we open ten to know that in the next hundred? And then you get this whole complicated set of reasonings about how often or in which kind of samples one should be seen, seeing in order to say something about how large a class of other objects. One body, is that the body? Or is this maybe only the male body? Or only the white body? I mean, you cannot quite see what kind of body this is. So how generalizable and non-generalizable is a fact. However, when the scientists were brought down to Earth, a very different question emerged that had to do with their transportability. How far can you transport a fact? And I'll explain how you can, uh, th this sounds counterintuitive in the first instance, but it became very relevant uh, in the second. I'll give you a simple example, that of anemia. La oh, I should make a little detour. All my examples today, most of my examples today, will have to do with food. I have started to do research on food. A few of them are actually examples that I've studied myself. Most I get from the literatures that I'm reading. This is an example from an older study that I did on anemia, but it is about iron deficiency anemia, and this has everything to do with either food deficiencies or worms or malaria or other, um, that kind of related uh, diseases, so it's still close. Well. Iron deficiency anemia can be diagnosed in a laboratory way with this kind of machine. It's a hemoglobin <coughs> measurement machine. Hemoglobin is the molecule in, uh, that transport oxygen, so if you don't have enough, and it makes the blood red. So you can measure the amount of hemoglobin because it gives different shades of red depending on how much hemoglobin there is in the blood. So in this machine, if you put in a little drop of blood, you can read out the number there of the hemoglobin level. So that is typical laboratory technique that is made allegedly to travel because it would y yield the same result for everybody everywhere and it was supposed to be a generalized fact. However, when you start to ask <coughs> transportability questions, this change just very dramatically because so already you see here is a plug. Now this happens to be a US plug. You could already not use this machine right like that here, so you would have to change the plug. But if you go to rural Africa, um, it, things become yet far more complicated. Do you have electricity at all in the village where as a tropical doctor you're working? If you have electricity, how many time, hours of the day? Uh, is there anybody around who can handle the machine? Because if you're the doctor, you're not going to do that. There are 50 more patients waiting for the next two hours. Uh, so the question whether this method is generalizable is very different from the question whether it is transportable. And the, the moot point, of course, to end with, you, ha you need blood for that thing, so you need to prick blood. Now, if you don't have a really good sterilization system, you don't break blood in Africa. It's crazy because you risk to uh, spread HIV for the sake of diagnosing anemia. Far better to just give iron and presume that somebody has anemia. And for that matter, there's a quite different way of diagnosing, which is the clinical diagnosis, which is actually an older way of diagnosing anemia. And this I took from the web from an uh, explanation of how to go about it. Uh, if we go... Uh, 
These are the sort of clinical signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia. And here is a picture that shows the young doctor or the traveling doctors how to go about it. People tend to have a somewhat paler tongue. If you do the eyelid like this, if somebody has serious anemia, it's very white. Nail beds are whiter. So how does that, and then there are symptoms like breathlessness, headaches, and tiredness. How does that transport? The complicated thing is that often tropical doctors don't speak the local language. So maybe the very the stories that people have about their tiredness or breathlessness don't go travel very easy either. But looking into an eyelid or looking at a tongue is very travels very easily. So it travels in a fluid way because it is not exactly the same anemia that you get whether you use one symptom or the other, the next one way or the other. And what's actually more odd is that most, this, I, I studied this based on interviews with tropical doctors, most of them had never seen any really severe clinical anemia before they went to Africa because it hardly occurs in the Netherlands where they had their training. So the local nurses taught them how to see this. So this is a very interesting type of traveling. It is not specifically that clinical diagnosis would be a sort of traditional local knowledge in Africa, but the nurses who had worked there for quite a while had got to know it. So it's a very complex pattern of traveling. But for what I want to explain is just to say that the question whether uh, the questions of transportability are very different from questions of generalizability. Generalizability you decide about in the relation between your method and your object. Transportability you decide about while moving along with a method and a fact as they transport or do not transport along the world. And this is the kind of things that you as geographers of course know a lot about. Some things transport very easily like cars except when your infrastructure breaks down. So whether it's easier to transport something by car or by foot depends on the kind of road. It depends on the state of the road. This is a particular spot where there was water under the road and the road wasn't built properly for... It, it had a pipe with water and it was presupposed to be a little bit of water. Huh? You know these stories. Suddenly there is a lot of water, but road away. And of course sometimes walking on foot travels a lot easier because, it's not for horses, that one is forbidden for horses, that's why I liked it so much in terms of transportability and not. Uh, so you may think the car is the easiest to transport, then comes the horse and then on foot, but some cars <coughs> are better travelled on foot and the clinical anemia is a good example of that. It travels better to places that are intractable, that are more difficult to go to. So what is more generalizable and what is better transportable does not necessarily map. And asking one question or the other is very different. Now, transport is not just between literal <coughs> regions of the globe, like the north and the south. Transport is also between problem orientations, between pr issues, between concerns. And as an example, I want to talk about the transportability of the calorie. The calorie is a measurement of the energy content of food. It is also a measure of the energy content of fuels, of cars. It was actually made in the context of the combustion engine. And I read recently this wonderful historical article that explained how the same measurement machines that had been used for combustion engines in a university were then used to measure the energy uh, use of students on a bicycle and students learning French. It was very beautiful uh, how the same method in that sense can be transported from one side to the other. This is what methods do, they transport. And in the problem context of inventing the calorie was the problem of food scarcity. And this is the kind of map uh, that tries in a specific way to map food scarcity. Maybe there are a few non geographers they might want to know that this kind of mapping uh, translates the size that you would give on a graph into the size of the Earth. So if you would give India this size of a graph in terms of the amount of uh, malnutrition, you make India big on the map. And Europe is very small there because there is very little malnutrition compared in this kind of graphing. So this kind of context, the calorie was, um, was crafted first, was made as a method uh, with the idea, for instance, in, in the US specifically, that there was the question, 
how little you could pay a worker and then the worker could still survive and have enough calories to eat. And the other concern wasn't already with uh, colonies and how, if there were hunger, what was the minimum amount of food that people needed to survive. So the calorie is designed to handle scarcity in, <coughs> in this type of early 20th century way of just survival. Now, if people in uh, both rich countries and in uh, rich cities in the south come across calorie concerns these days, they have a completely different context. Calories are used in many sites and situations to handle abundance. And what we see by <laughs> EU regulation on all our packages these days is uh, nutritional facts. And most of those are biochemical facts, but number one is the biophysical fact of the calorie. How much calories does this contain? And as consumers, we are supposed to then count those calories and not go beyond 2,000 calories, kilocalories, of course. We need every day. Uh, some of you may even have 2,500 if you're a young enough and energetic enough man. Well, um, so this is a whole different setting. It's a setting where the calorie enters together with an idea that you choose your food, which is a particularly odd idea, actually, and with the idea that there is, you can eat things that are good, green, eat things that are orange, maybe half good, and things that are bad. So it's a completely different conception of, the f of food where a calorie enters. And that causes other transportability problems. It changes the meaning of the calorie. I'll come back to the calorie later on to make that even a bit harder. So there are, one may ask with all kinds of transportabilities, both over the earth and between fields or between problem contexts, what changes? Now this was a kind of question that if you talk about generalization, you cannot ask. Something is either the same or different. It is either true everywhere or true nowhere. With transportability as sort of the way to frame your concerns about the transport of scientific results, the question is always, what changes, what does stay the same? What alters along the way? What has a different meaning, either in a different geographical site, or in a different discipline, or in a different problem context? And uh, this is um, <coughs> people, actually women, washing bananas in uh, Costa Rica, where they try to clean the bugs, so to make the bananas transportable. And this is a nice metaphor for what many scientists do as well. If you have your facts, you polish them a little bit, you take the bugs out to make them better transportable. But even if you wash your bananas, they don't travel easily. With bananas especially, this is of course very obvious. That's why I like this picture in this particular site to illustrate this. So that was in the scheme of things that I promised you first. My number one, the question of, how did I put it, bringing the sciences down to earth. We now move to question number two, which is to understand difference in sci the sciences uh, as historical or as topographical. Now, this is not an either or that you can do it in one way or the other. But in the 1980s, in the uh, context of studying sciences and methods, there was a great fashion of uh, taking difference historically. And how was this done? This was done by, as I put it here, in many in controversy studies. And the aim of doing controversy studies was to show that present facts, so facts that were facts that had won the controversy, and they were not bound to win from the beginning. It was fairly contingent that they had won and not uh, the others. It could have been <coughs> otherwise. Uh, like it could have been that our man there had sold Pepsi and not cola. So this is the historical question, how come that he sells cola? In the same way you can wonder how come that we have the calorie and then you can go back and you can see the opponents of the calorie at the time and go into those controversies and see how this win. You can also do this with technologies. Why do we have the bicycle that we have and not one with a high wheel in the front and a small wheel in the back? And you can go into controversies and show that it, uh, this general idea, it could have been otherwise, it just went this way. Now there were a massive amount of that kind of studies uh, done in the 80s in the, in the social studies of science. 
uh, what they all did, in a way, is presume that indeed controversies <coughs> come to a closure, that at some point there is a winner, at some point they end. And this makes some sense if you look at the kind of materials they study. If you study frontline laboratory research, there is a ritual fight that is done in journals where you have discussions, especially in these very small fields. Now you have to remember, if you're studying nuclear physics, the community you work with is a lot smaller than uh, studying the city of Utrecht or Nijmegen. Oh, that is vervelend. Do we keep fout of the instituted apparatus? Van de zijkant of zo. Wat ik hoor, neemt u nu uh, het handen van dat ding? Oh. Als jullie erg hebben. Je doet wat je wil. Ja, zo maakt het anders. Oké. Ik beweeg natuurlijk te veel. Ja. Um, gaat het zo beter? Mooi. Um, dus, so it makes some sense to study uh, closures of fight if you follow frontline research which is about ritual fights where in the end indeed someone wins. Now I happen to go uh, and do my study in the hospital and the interesting thing there is that, and this is the same for, for many uh, places where science is being applied, if you go into fields where they use agricultural knowledge or anywhere in an applied context, what people do in applied context is solve problems and draw in as many scientific stuff as they can handle and then it need not be coherent at all, and there is not necessarily closure, there may be coexistence. It's like with drugs, you don't have one drug, you have one for eye problems, one for forgetfulness, and one for power for men and women. What kind of power would that be? So in the clinic, uh, you don't have fights until the end, you have coexistence of several drugs in this case for different problems, but you also have a uh, lot more uh, coexistence. I'm go and give an example of coexistence by going into an example of a few methods. Methods of studying taste. Taste is a wonderful object. I'm very glad I found that. I, I'm not recommending it for all of you to study. It might become too crowded in the field, but if anybody of you studies it, let, let's link up. One of the methods to study taste is a, a classical laboratory method uh, and uh, there it was the question where it's a localizing question as some of these biological fields do like where in the tongue do you taste what and step the next step is where in the brain is this registered registered so then you can also make your um, your brain mapping images mapping and comes all these wonderful colors, there you map sweet, uh, you, you find out about sweetness. The interesting bit, what I really like, I mean every, every object is nice once you open it up, even in a geopolitical way, because the interesting bit is that Western scientists had studied bitter, salty, sweet and sour for quite a while, and uh, until the Japanese started to join this field in the early uh, 20th century and said, where is umami? umami? Why haven't you studied umami? And the Japanese started to map umami and they found where you could uh, do umami and it was the same on the tongue but in a different place in the brain and, and nobody in the West could taste umami in the beginning. So taste researchers had to learn to taste umami because everybody in Japan tastes umami. So this is one of the, it's actually one of the rare fields where uh, you, you really get this new concept in that f did not fit the cultural tradition of the West, but it was completely natural in Japan that you would have umami, and where now you can no longer publish in a taste research, one of these big American journals for blah, 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 if you don't have umami. No, 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 you're not up to don't have umami, so I, I like that. Uh, this, these things do happen in laboratory research. So this is the first way to study taste, and the interesting thing is also what it makes of taste. What is taste here? Taste is a fact. It's a neutral fact. So taste, one of the things that doubles so nicely with taste is that you don't have just methods to study taste, but of course tasting itself is a method. The amount of Droster nurses carrying the chocolate on the, uh, everybody in Dutch, we have these traditional uh, nurse who comes with the hot chocolate on the 
package of hot chocolate on which there is another nurse who carries the package of hot chocolate. And this is the regressive thing. Now, with taste, this is very much going on because you have, of course, method of studying something that is a method of the body to learn about the world. But in the, in the lab, they take this method to be a factual method, just like they take <coughs> their own method to be a factual method. This is all about facts. This, however, there is a limit to this kind of research. And actually, right now, it's into great trouble because, as you know, it's much easier to do research if you get financed by the industry. And the industry is not interested in where we taste anything at all. They want to know about what tastes good. They're not in not neutrality. So there is a second way of laboratory testing, of, um, of, of knowing what taste is. And it has to do, it goes far more to the site of the object being tasted. So it doesn't ask where does the body taste, but what? How does this taste? And it is not does this taste sweet, salt, or sour, but does it taste good, bad, or better? That doesn't work, but it's a nice joke. Good. So there you see two people in, in, in India who are tasting different kinds of coffee to try to figure out which is the one tasting best. So these are, this is a wonderful profession, the professional tasters. You have them a lot in all kinds of industries. Their method is very different. They talk about taste. They, get, they make vocabularies to discuss <coughs> taste. And you also have this in the so-called consumer panels where an industry gets consumers together and they get these numbered type of glasses and they get lists with names and words and they start to train their taste. In an afternoon, they learn to taste. It's not that they're presumed to be able to, you ask, tell me which orange juice is best. No, no, no. You get people together. They have elaborated this of what is a good tasting practice. So they organize a tasting practice around the method of taste. Where, they where people get educated into tasting. The extreme example of this is wine tasting, where people get educated over years in order to be able to taste. Now that is tasting practice number two, so another method, and it makes something different of its object, taste. A taste is an appreciation, it is something appreciative, and it is a complex object that ha doesn't have to, cannot be pulled down in that same kind of way. Now comes the a photo that I didn't make, but that uh, resonates with the little example for those of you who read the summary. Last year I was doing field work in a nursing home, and um, the, the women who were in the restaurant uh, handing around food then picked up the cutlery again and the soup cups and all asked, does it taste nice? And I had been walking around there all day. Every, all of you who do ethnographic field work know you start to get more and more embarrassed by doing nothing. So I thought, ah, picking up cups, I can do that. So I started to pick up cups. And since I looked pretty much like the other women working there in the eyes of the, I had a sweater on, and, uh, in the eyes of the uh, people who lived there, I was yet another carer. So I was treated as a carer. Now, the first person I asked to, did it taste well? In Dutch, was it lekker? This is very hard to... Already the fact that you cannot translate this into English. I had lots of problems because lekker is a very nice word. Okay. So, yeah, you see, uh, taste is not the same, not exactly the same in different languages. My, one of my German friends is completely delighted that we use lekker not only for food but also for the weather and for sex and for pretty much anything. And in Germany, in just the food. Anyway, um, good. So I asked this woman, uh, was, it, was it good? Did you like it? And she looks at me and she says, yes, dear. And the whole way she says this, instead of she being the woman cared for, makes me being the woman cared for. And she sort of wants to show that she appreciates that I'm there caring for her. I mean, you can sense this in the moment. And she does, the, she shifts, she takes on the caring role. So what you see there is that the taste of the soup is not about asking me about the taste of the soup. It's a very bad method to get to know about the taste of the soup because the taste of the soup, the, the qualification overflows, as you could say. It, it overflows into qualification of other things. So it overflows into her qualifying my care. Well, the care that she got with the soup. The second woman I found even more... How to say this? I thought, wow, what a field work. Uh, because the second woman says to me, yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah, you don't hear me complain. 
So she was there in this nursing home. She knew that she could never, I mean, she was later in her late 80s, that it was no, no way that she would live anywhere else. And what she was qualifying is both her life, I don't complain, and herself, I'm not a complainer. So, um, and that is how I survive. So whether the soup was got good or not, had, well, this sort of indicated might not have been that good but for her, but whether the soup was good or not was no longer the issue. The overflow of qualification itself was the issue. So we have seen three methods um, for trying to find out about taste. And um, I want to underline that not one of these methods is more real than the other. What you've seen in the social scientists say 20 years ago is that the social scientists would scold the laboratory people and say, you don't get real taste because it's not lived taste. And then they had the other way around that people who do laboratory studies would say to the social scientists, you don't have real taste, this is just all people babbling a bit. And uh, what I want to insist on is that instead of doing either the reductionism critique or vice versa, the critique you're not scientific enough, these things are not interesting. The question is, which method gets to know what about the world? You get simply different objects with different metals. You, you know about different things. You may know about where in the brain you feel, you, you sense umami. This is a perfectly interesting thing to know, maybe, in some context. Or you may know whether this is good coffee or which of the three orange juices or absinthe juices is the better one. Or you may t know all kind of things about nursing homes and the, the relevance of food and taste <coughs> in a nursing home. These are different objects and I, I thought, thought it's nice to symbolize that with the photo of completely different realities coexisting. When as a Westerner you first see the house god next to the Coca-Cola, you're sort of surprised because you think that house gods are pre-modern and Coca-Cola is the symbol of modernism, but after seeing the tenth house got next to the Coca-Cola, you get used to it, and it's simply a juxtaposition. This is the reality of the world. We have house gods and Coca-Cola, and we have constantly that kind of mixtures. And the, in that sense, the complex thing here, and this is where geography can do in, if you have, co if you have historical difference in history, one thing comes after the other. If you have coexistence in time, the question becomes what kind of specialities to map this coexistence in. Uh, the, because the threat is always that people come with very simplistic regional mappings. Now my example was fairly regional, you have the lab, you have the, the test and you have the nursing home, but that is to be didactic. But if you see in lots of practices these things, how to say, coexist in far more complex ways. They, they either have complex boundaries like uh, <coughs> Northwest passage where something passes or doesn't pass, etc., and so on, or they're even inside each other, like one thing presupposes the other, etc., and so on. So the kind of to topologies that you need to, to to make the topography of this are quite complex, and I think um, deserves to be explored. Now on to my topic number three. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you what you meant with uh, questions of coordination? Yes, you can. Uh, thank you for that, because I, what, one of the things that happens if you have different methods that know objects in different ways, and you still use the same word, the question is how you go from one realm to the other, mm -hmm. and how you coordinate one way of knowing with the other. And for instance, if a traditional uh, taste researcher in the lab might say that his object really underlies everything else. Now this is a lazy form of coordination. Uh, but you, ha you might have more complex forms of coordination, for instance, you might still in a nursing home context use the tasting of salt, which is perfect, and you might say how people like, are used to salt and then like salt, and maybe they need to eat less salt, so how can you change the t adaptation to that kind of taste, etc. So you can coordinate between these modes of knowing, and sometimes it makes sense to know, but how, for, I, I developed this coordination note in my research in the hospital where for instance different technologies know in very different ways, a bit like these tastes, and then it's about the same patient. So how can you still do as if it is the same patient? <coughs> there the most dramatic and lazy coordination form is to dump all kind of 
incoherent information on the patient and make the patient uh, do the coordination work, which is... <laughs> But you can also find uh, name tags, uh, reports, and, and those are coordination devices to coordinate between methods and, and the worlds they come with. Yeah. Just thank you for asking the question because this was a bit sloppy of me. That's the risk of not writing our stuff down. So thanks for that. Good. I need a bit of water. Three. You can already reach what I do with my <coughs> cooking devices there. Now, we, we compared science with Coca-Cola, so why not with cooking? Now, method, if we say that, insist that matters is a practice, one of the correct characteristics of a practice is that it's always somewhere. Now, you have heard this in your geography class 101. Everything happens somewhere. But what is it to happen somewhere? Um, there has been research about the situatedness of science and the first wave of that was sociological in the sense that it also situated sciences sociologically by saying, for instance, this has been done in feminism, it's um, different whether a woman uh, starts coming, in, whether women start coming into field because with their sociological baggage they look at things differently. There are some strong cases of that. I'll give you, I'll give you my favorite example which is that of ethologist and the lion. You all know about the lion. The lion lives in social groups of one male and uh, uh, five, six females plus their young. And this had been researched in ethology as a typical harem where the man has his women. And then um, a feminist came into the field actually and they said, hey, that's an interesting way of living together with women and sharing the care for the children well, of course, you need semen to have the children. So you tolerate one man in the group, you pick out the best one, the one that gives you the best father material, and you allow him to live with you, and then you just carry on and you're not bothered by all the others. So this is a different way to frame. Now, that is a, it's a, so funny because it's so obvious. But uh, that is a sociological way to situate. That has some senses, but it only goes so far and it's more fun to do more complex situating practices like I did in my talk before. For instance, one may situate the calorie in research into scarcity and then you see where it happens. That's a way of situating. You may see the calorie these days in trying to discipline uh, populations that are in risk of overweight and then that is where it happens. But the, the risk with situating is, again, to, to a, a lesson that your discipline can bring in, is that most non-geographers who start to situate have very regional notions of what a place is. So they start to situate in regional ways. Now, situating deserves to be done in a far more complex way. And uh, what I'll do here is... Um, to, to, what my uh, heading three is about is to talk about situating. Now I'm not going to use an example of situating methods because I don't have one that is tamed and tellable, but I take the example of situating food and use it as sort of a model for situating methods. I, I think, I told you before, this is my method to shift from one thing to the other, to understand one thing from the other. So from understanding food, I can understand method, and from understanding method, I can understand food. It's a kind of way of using examples and using materials not in their own setting, but moving them around, which is, by the way, a way of both doing transportation and doing situatedness. Now, where is food? Food is so wonderful. Uh, you can ask in a first instance, is it local or is it topographically complex? Now here, People along the road in Ghana are eating spiders. This is a fairly local. Uh, they would have a hard time transporting their spiders to Amsterdam. Guess. Uh, so, so you have that all over the world, that kind of local food <coughs> practices. Dropius, for instance, they start to travel a little bit, but they're fairly local regionally in the Netherlands. So you have, you have all kind of weird habits of local food. But the tomatoes who are in the market a bit further away from there are much more interesting 
to, to have a much more interesting topography uh, because they come from everywhere and move everywhere. I won't do the example with the tomato. I mean, uh, uh, to begin with, they come from uh, South America and they have moved over the world. They have conquered the world. The tomatoes are very strong in conquering the rest of us because they have so many attractive aspects. I'll give another uh, food that was only uh, spread over the world uh, after the Europeans had finally found out uh, about the Americas, which is corn, maize, maize, they pronounce it in English. Maize is wonderful. I, I recently read this very good book, of Maize and Grace, about maize in Africa. And uh, it's a bit uh, chaotic book, but every chapter is a jewel in itself. One, one that I liked very much was the chapter on Ghana, where this author, whether it's true or not, it's too beautiful not to be true. The author showed that uh, the Ghanese got, well, the Ashanti, which is the, was then the strongest uh, people in Ghana, they got maize seeds from uh, the Dutch and the French with whom they traded slaves. The Ashanti were strong, so they could do slave raids and sell the slaves to the Dutch and the French. And, and then they got maize back. And actually, because they had maize for the first time, they had a crops that had enough circular value for them to make cities. Because the fact that, the Af that in that part of Africa there were no cities had, of course, nothing to do with the Africans. It, the, thing number one was that none of their crops yielded enough overproduction for cities to grow. With, with maize, they could have cities. So Ashanti became the first kingdom because they had maize that they got from uh, the South America, from the slave traders, and then they become so strong that they could do more slave trading. So there's your a crucial factor, fact of maize in history. This is actually maize in Ethiopia, which is a more tragic story in a way, because Ethiopia, they had uh, lots of other food products like teff, who in many ways are better food for the human body than maize. They have, for instance, better proteins, etc., and so on. Um, but maize ha has, an, if it's done well, a surprising high yield, which is one of the reasons it caught on in Ethiopia, and also in some places it's done better. Actually, over the last 20, 30 years, it, there has more and more maize has grown and less and less teff, which has to do with the fact that teff, you have to take care of your little field very well and over a long time. With maize, if there is a war going on, as there was over much of that time, you can abandon your field and you come back a few months later and you have food. So this is one of these typical ways in which food travels. Now, uh, sorry to yield on the story, but this is travel is the way in which uh, spaces, uh, how to say this, in which situatedness is complex. That photo is in Ethiopia. Yeah, it is in Ethiopia. But it's not in Ethiopia that is only local. It is in Ethiopia that has both the history of uh, maize growing in Latin America itself and the history of the transportation of maize over the world and the specific history incorporated. So it is a local that has elsewhere inside it. Now the second way uh, in which food is and isn't situated is by uh, the simple traveling of products, now uh, of food products. Now, a lot of traveling is done with a lot of effort. And one of the striking things about this whole traveling of food products is the endless packaging that goes along with it. Well, earlier we saw the bananas that were cleaned to transport them. This is still a fairly uh, basic form of packaging. But in a second instance, you get this endless detailed packaging of little things so as to be that for them to be transported. <coughs> so that the transportability of the product becomes almost more important than the product and that food travels in the second way. Food also travels in the form of meals. So here you see the white hand eating the uh, South Asian dish and there you see the Thai advertisement for pizza. Uh, pizza is one of the European dishes that has a striking global success uh, just as a in the first instance, Chinese food, well, this is Vietnamese food, doesn't make that much different from this. I mean, Chinese is also 75 different things, of course, uh, has traveled very well 
over the rest of the world in other ways. So you have all kind of very nice books about the traveling of China, the globalization of Chinese food, and the globalization of McDonald's, and the globalization of the pizza. So you have all kind of meals that travel. Others, of course, that do not travel. I mean, none of these traveling things is obvious. You have all kind of things that make it into traveling and do not make it. The <coughs> most fascinating one in a way is the traveling and non-traveling of taste. Oh, well, let me go back. Oh, uh, For the traveling of meals to take place, you, you have, for instance, a complex technology to travel along with it. One of the things that happens is that the wok is being sold uh, in countries like the Netherlands and wok food, but not wok fire. So uh, vice versa, in order to make pizza, you need an oven. Now, oven was not in the traditional equipment of Asian kitchens. So then you, do you need an oven or are you going to, you can always adapt either. Huh? Here the, the, the Vietnamese food is eaten with the chopsticks, but you can eat it with a fork. Uh, now, Vietnamese uh, pizza should be cooked in an oven, but you can cook it on a pan. So you can have these traveling things that travel and do not travel uh, and alter along the way. Um, some of you must have read, it's another of my favorite books, uh, Golden Arches East, which is a book about uh, McDonald's in Southeast Asia, where the authors were anthropologists who were faced with this version of globalization theory that said that everything was going to be the same, where McDonald's was always used as an example. McDonald's was going to be everywhere. So they went to their local McDonald's, so they went to sit in Beijing in the McDonald's or Hong Kong in the McDonald's, and they wrote solid traditional ethnography of their uh, of their McDonald's. If you haven't read it, you should. I mean, it's a delightful book because it shows how these McDonald's are in some instance the same. For instance, crucially actually in hygiene standards, they export uh, globalized hygiene standards and in some ways completely different because I, in Beijing the asset of the McDonald's was that you didn't have to buy something more expensive than the next table for, in order for your guests to be happy, which was the traditional thing in a Chinese restaurant. So, in Hong Kong, the asset was that the children could make safe homework there and it was better than in their houses that were too spare, etc. and so on. You get all good traveling. The traveling of taste is quite complex. Here, uh, this is Vietnam, where you can buy French bread. Now, the traditional Vietnamese uh, breakfast is po, which is a soup, and you can buy that everywhere in Vietnam. But the French who have left Vietnam in '54 are long survived by their bread, and the Vietnamese who are very proud that they have kicked out the French are also very proud that they can bake very good French bread, and that it is so nice. So somehow the taste traveled and managed to stay around without the French, and uh, this is really one of the things many people really like. On the other hand, taste doesn't travel always very well. The classical anecdote is that of the Westerner who cannot handle hot food, which is uh, <coughs> symbolized there in a fairly old English cartoon. At this moment, the most sold takeout food in the UK is not fish and chips, but chicken masala. Now, chicken masala is fairly sweet, and especially if you buy it in England, but still something changed. So, but you can't, it isn't, some things travel better than others, so some taste has to, if you would have thought 30 years ago that chicken masala would become the takeout food number one. It would have been hard to believe. So these things may also tra travel fast. The conclusion of this number three argument is that a site is not local but always already military sited. If you study in a site and you say this is just local, you haven't done your homework, you haven't worked hard enough to see how the rest of the world is always already there in all these complex ways. Like, if I look at the food on the plate I'll have tonight, I can see all these travels usually. You can see them all happening in any one plate. You have the rice, and that is that, if you have a place with, plate with rice, the rice may come from India, it may come from the US, so that is the, the product travel. Uh, and of course, uh, if you have the banana, it is both the product travel. Actually, the banana will come uh, from Latin America, where well, originally the banana came from Pakistan. So uh, there is the geographical traditional travel. You will have the meal. It's unlikely that I'm going to get a very ordinary Dutch meal. That doesn't happen in restaurants to begin with. 
and uh, all kind of my taste is supposed to be adapted to all kind of things that uh, happened along the way, etc. So this a site is always multi-local, and with taste it's fairly easy to show. But if you do your <coughs> work hard, you can see about anything. So you can always ask what is absent present. This picture I took in the Lofoten, which is in the north of Norway, and this is what's the word in English again? It's uh, cot, dried cot, stockfish in Dutch. And um, there are a few places that, in first instance, look more isolated and local than the north of the North Foten, of the Lofoten. It takes quite a while, even with modern technology, to get there. And you think, now I'm at the end of the world. What was explained to me in the north of Lofoten, of course, I always do field work, so I start to talk about the cod. This cod is being sold forever to specific Italian villages. So there are links between Italian villages and the north of the North Foten, where there are long-standing tra trading routes, and then from there it is spread further. If you go to the north of Brazil, one of the very expensive things you can buy there is dried cod from the Lofoten, because the this was for the Portuguese, this was one of the top dishes because it was good fish. Now, of course, the last thing you need in the north of Brazil is to import fish from the north of the Lofoten because there's plenty of fish. But because the um, Portuguese traveled this and had this, they had, in, like many colonizers, they fancied their homegrown things more. They, they didn't adapt their taste as much as to food, as much as uh, a lot of other things. So now you have these kind of complexity. All those things, if you work hard enough, can be seen in that photo. So the question, uh, if, you do st if you study something, we talked about this morning, about studying the absent, is to find things that are absent and to see how things are absent present in any one site. Can I just add a few de details? It's Baco, Baco, yeah. Oh, it's Baco, yeah. And it's a Dutch word which comes from the VOC. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it used to be a poor man's uh, Food. That's why it needed also to be salted, and now it's actually uh, it's very expensive. Uh, it, it has been so it's more or less. Kind of yes. Kind of, yeah, but okay. Thank you for the addition. But the salting is is for to keep it fresh, to keep it from rotting, rather than uh, being poor or rich. Yeah. yeah. So the, the history of salt goes into that in in yet another way. But thank you for the addition. The buckle, That was the word. So sites are never local. Now, question number four. With the question whether scientific results could have influence on the rest of the world, that again has often been thought along temporal lines. Does effects follow? Does this have effects? Does something come after it? Does it have influence? It was a kind of, uh, here is the research and there is the influence. Now, if you ask this question, sometimes things, uh, it, scientific results have inf or facts have influence and sometimes not. And I make the little joke here that it is like cheese. I mean, if you want to spread cheese, you need to do work. You need to package it and market it and say Gouda is very, very nice and all the rest of it. So with facts again, to spread them, they don't spread all by themselves. But what I would like to go into is the two, for now, is the two modes of, uh, there are many more, there's a lot to unpack here again. Again, I pick up just a, a small thing, which is the question how you think of the effect of science, whether you do that in a kind of intervention <coughs> mode or in an interference mode. And this is again two very different models. The intervention mode I use in the photo of a vaccination. Vaccination is typical a case of intervention. You uh, it is indeed, it's also physically, it is an intervention, uh, but it's also an intervention in the girl's immune system, or in, and it's an intervention in the population for that matter, uh, where something is done by people who are delegates, uh, like this nurse of science, and she has a stethoscope, it's a symbol of a doctor, maybe she's a doctor, <coughs> which would be re strange that she gives the vaccination, but it doesn't matter. Um, intervention in an intervention model, you have a fact or a fact packaged into a product like a vaccine, 
that is used to change something in the world, like in the spreading of infectious diseases, for one, that the real intervention here you don't see, the real intervention in vaccination is not in the human body but in the population. So you cannot always see on a photo what is intervened in, but this is an intervention. You have the vaccine and you intervene in the population. The other picture is the food pyramid in Vietnam, this one. Uh, and what is done there is not so much an intervention. I mean, my guess would be that this wouldn't be read in the first place and then not picked up and then not be made relevant in the daily lives of most people because the food pyramid is a very, very odd idea about what food is. It, it, classes, it classifies food into all kinds of ways that don't fit in with any other daily life classification of food. And it says all kinds of things about them that are not very easy to transport. But uh, the idea there is that, in a way, you interfere with understandings of food that are already there. Instead of just adding something, like with an intervention or changing something, you try to, how to say this, to modify things that are already there. People already have conceptions about food, so influencing them is more difficult. Or it's not more difficult, it is not, it is not in a blank. You don't add something where there was a blank before. You uh, interfere trying to shape, change the shape of something that already had a shape. I give an example of that, for which I go back to the limiting calorie intake that I promised to you to tell more about. Uh, the whole warning around food in uh, countries and regions where there is, are enough calories at least, has to do with the idea that people should limit their food intake. This has to do with uh, an obvious, or maybe not too obvious, but an increase in the number of people Okay, in the number of people who are overweight and in the number of people who are obese. Now, in order to counter <coughs> that, there are all kind of interference attempts in our lives where, as I told you before, we are being taught to count calories. And especially if people visit a dietitian because they want to lose weight or because their doctor has said the complaints that you present me with have to do with your being overweight. So if people start on a track to lose weight, they get advice by a dietitian about how they should count the calories, how they should restrict, how they maybe how they can build this in into their daily life. But the whole idea is one of containment. And this is not very surprising if you go back into the history of the calorie. For one, I told you it was linked up with a combustion eng engine. For another, that is what I add now, this whole, pra this whole invention was done by a very um, severe Protestant who had this very deep conviction that things should not be spilled and that we should be live in a prudent way and in a uh, moderate way and in a constricted way. The calorie fits in completely with that. Now, what is packed along with that is, this, is a very specific image of what a human body is it is an image of a human body as something that would eat on and on and have more and more lust and pleasure and all the rest of it, except if it was contained by some rational mind or some uh, severe replacement of God, the superego or the father who would forbid the body. This image of the body is contained. You don't see it there, but it's there. That's the image of the body that you can see there. Now, interestingly, even in wonderful, nice laboratory, uh, research, completely different images of the body circulate. You don't have to be anti reductions to find other images of the body. In Wageningen, they also do research with the very different research question, when do bodies stop eating all by themselves? Because usually bodies do. And it's not the case that they keep on eating. This is a presumption that's built in there, but it's not what people do. And um, <coughs> What they did, for instance, or this is done somewhere else earlier, is give people apples, apple sauce, and apple juice, and then see how many calories they happen to eat. And you can, it's not with your high school knowledge, it's already easy to understand that if you drink apple juice, you will stop after a lot more calories than when you eat an apple. Because the apple juice, whoops, eh, this is away in a split second, and then you start to, 
and you have hardly any taste because it goes very fast. If you eat the apple, you eat 15 minutes and you have finished the apple and all the time you have this wonderful taste of this nice apple. So the amount of satisfaction provided by an apple is much more than provided by uh, apple juice for the same amount of calories. And the, uh, the apple sauce appeared to be in the middle. Now some of these Wageningen researchers have thought, well, maybe it's because the chewing takes so much effort. So they have designed something with chocolate pudding, half pudding and not pudding, where they put in pumps, etc. and so on. They have done away with the variable of the effort and they found the same thing. The longer the food is in the mouth the, and the, the more it is there, the, early, the less calories you eat. So there, their hypothesis was, uh, from the laboratory research, that bodies seek a certain amount of pleasure, of satisfaction. The conclusion would be, if you would design from there a dietitian practice, very different from restrict calories, it would be to help people to learn to get more satisfaction. Not restrict your pleasure, but live your pleasure. Not stop feeling your body but become a severe mind, but start feeling your body and start to feel when, it, feel when it's, had, it's had enough. So the complete opposite, this is a nice example of a complete opposite way of dealing with the world depending on how you do your first basic research. So the effect of the research is not in uh, after the facts, once you have the facts, but the, the whole way of interfering with the world is in day one, it's in the design of the research and in the research question. You cannot <coughs> find out about a pleasure if you design your whole research about how many calories does a body need. If you ask the question how much calories does a body eat, it's a perfect question, but pleasure doesn't take, it's no part of that universe. If you ask the question when do bodies stop eating, you, will, you may come across pleasure. So how research interferes or may interfere with the world depends. It's the, again, it's not sort of a historical latest thing, it's not the latest thing. It's there always already. It's, uh, in that sense, has to do with shaping and framing. What are you laughing at? Good. The question, however, then becomes, who's fact rule? Because in the traditional method question, um, the, the, the quality of the science was guaranteed by the method, in a way. Method had to protect us against crooks. As long as you follow the method, it didn't depend who was doing the research. Now, everybody can put uh, a plate on their door that they are a topographical, but who are we going to? I, I like this one because I, it is a nice profession, the topographical. No, the topographical it is. Uh, but whose facts rule becomes a very different question. If you have calorie researchers and pleasure researchers, who, how are we going to shape dieting practices? Well, the, of course, the problem so far is that there is no we who's saying, who, how are we going to shape dieting practice? They have been shaped very, to a fair extent in one way. And you see in some forefronts of dietitians who, who like to work along the second one line, this is being done. There is no central, how to say, central authority in this kind of practice and some other practices is. But this becomes a new question. Uh, asked in a new, uh, an extra, it's an actually an old question that comes to be asked in a new way. So that is why I come now with my further questions. So if the good of method is not its transparency, what else might it be? Now there are some philosophers like Isabelle Stangers, who maybe some of you know, who have come up with the idea that the good of the method might mean, in how, does it yield surprises? Do you already know on day one what you're going to find, or do you build your method in such a way that along the way you may be surprised? Uh, oh, I forgot something. The transparency trope is, of course, totally an optical trope. It is the idea that science is about seeing. Now, we've seen with all these things that this, this has completely it, gone away because all methods have to do with cutting and shaping and with the hands and with how they interfere and that alone makes transparency unthinkable. It has to do with 
dealing with hands, and we're dealing with the world. I'm experimenting right now to see how it may also have to do with me metabolism, like with tasting, with digesting. If you think through method through metaphors of digesting, something very complicated happens. Well, I don't know quite what yet. So that's other ways to start to think about method is by importing uh, new things. Now, some people think to come back to the introduction that actor, actor network theory is a method. <coughs> now, I may warn you, it is not. So the question is not whether I confess to be an actor network theorist or not. There is no such thing as actor network theory. Because there is a com profound confusion between a French notion of theory that is built into actor network theory and both an, an English language or a German language notion of theory. They have nothing to do with each other. And the, uh, the notion of theory as a kind of assemblage of understanding of ways about the world, that is not what actor network theory is doing. It is a set that people who work in that line who are being called actor network theorists have a set of reflexes of ways of approaching questions that they then dispute amongst each other. No, I don't like that article that you wrote. Oh, that was a nice one, etc. and so on. So there is no coherent body. It doesn't add up in that sense. It does enrich each other. This, in a way, in that sense, is a typical actor network presentation. And um, my friends in actor network would all recognize it. Ah, she's one of us. Yeah, 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 we knew it. But it's not because there is a theory. They would also, that's like the stupid, etc. and so on. It has to do with. Uh, turning things inside out, um, sort of trying to ask new questions, trying to see what, what words do and what kind of effects they have, etc. So I, I'm not even going to give a limited list because even that isn't there. It, it is a sort of um, way of going <coughs> through things, both with semiotic instance, with looking at materialities and practices, and with moving things around and shaping them up. But that in itself doesn't make them good, because then again, there's a kind of context dependency. What, there is no method without an object. In that sense, methods are always in a context of an object, in a context of a research project, in a context of an audience, etc., and so on. The whole idea that you could write your method chapter as chapter one, I don't know if any thesis supervisor here uh, would, uh, it's crap. Me methods need to be invented along the way while struggling with the object. If I do this, do I get to know something? No, it doesn't work. Shall I try this? Yeah, that's better, etc. and so on. The method is something that you can uh, pull on very many resources, but that needs to be tailor-made then again. You, you shouldn't approach it as if you were the first researcher on Earth. It, there's lots and lots of researches, but it needs to be always adapted. But that again doesn't make it good all by itself. The complex thing is that it is a bit like with a meal. You can never cook a very good meal out of a recipe book just like that if you have never cooked before. It, has to, it is a kind of thing that uh, is a skilled <coughs> practice that you can then talk about with your friends. We did like this meal. That other one was a disaster. So, however, there has been for quite a while a sort of implicit contract and that is a real, real difficult pr uh, question, I think. I, I seriously don't know how to deal with that. A real difficult contract that implied that politics would decide about the ends, that would be where the goals would be discussed, and science would deliver the facts and the means, and would be modest about the goals. Now, what we can do quite easily as a, as a collective right now is show that this is not the case. It's not how it works. A calorie is not a fact. A calorie is full of morals and moralities and goals and ends. And so is every, I, I can show that with the calorie, but so you can do, show that with all kinds of other things. But that means that this contract doesn't work. What do we have in its place? Because one of the dangerous things that are going to happen is a sort of flat politicization of politics. You've seen this in the US around climate um, change. Then the those who believe there is no such thing as climate change will say, yeah, they come up with social studies of science arguments and say uh, things are always contingent, maybe this isn't a true fact and, and there are, it's still a dispute, etc. So they unpack in that kind of ways. 
uh, and it's very hard to handle that kind of thing in a wise and responsible and, and good way. And it's not yet been invented what kind of new ways of relating and what new places of science could be. And another example is, for instance, the place of science in the pharmaceutical industry. In a way, the old idea that science is neutral protects the way sciences are used by the pharmaceutical industry. But making all science partial would rob you of lots of ways of criticizing pharmaceutical industry and the way it plays with data. So these kind of arguments are very difficult to handle wisely in a hot political context. And I think that is really one of the front lines of where we should be uh, concerned, that we should be concerned with when we are concerned with method. Thanks.